Good morning. Good morning. Uh, welcome back to our homegrown lecture series brought to you by Texas A&M AgriLife Extension here in Harris County. So this is starting off our new quarter um, and oops, and um, Paul Winsky has just returned from his California trials talk. So I think he's going to have a lot of really cool photos and really great information uh, to share from his trip. Uh, obviously, you know, showing tons of uh, pictures of flowers. Um, I mean, who doesn't like that? Uh, then next week, uh, or not next week, in two weeks, I will be doing the garden uh, hummingbird safety and uh, then you can just kind of glance we, we have a we cover a good amount of topics um, just as a reminder this is the ANR department so it's agriculture natural resources and horticulture so uh, we try to tap into each of those um, extension is all about educating and uh, it's we educate on all aspects um, around egg and in horticulture. Um, so, you know, as another reminder, you can also sign up for any of these topics uh, right now, so you won't have to remember to um, later. So when you go to sign up for one, you can sign up for all or part of them. Uh, but again, it's July 1st, we're almost to July 4th, so happy um, July 4th and uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, Paul's talk. One more thing also, uh, we do have a podcast now, so when you get the homegrown newsletter, it should be going out today. Uh, we're going to have a nice big, oh, there you go. Uh, you can take your phone right now. I mean, look what technology does. Uh, you could take your phone right now, uh, go to take a photo and when it focuses it'll say do you want to uh, click on this website and if you do that right now or when you're playing it back you can pause it and that podcast will come up we do have two podcasts now under our belt uh, the first one was uh, introducing all of us agents the three agents here paul shannon and myself and then the second one um, just dropped a day or two ago where uh, Paul talked with, uh, he spoke with um, someone he was in the industry uh, with about propagation. So uh, go ahead and check us out there. But in the meantime, uh, welcome Paul, uh, it's all yours. All right, well, thank you, Brandy. Uh, it is good to be here. Um, and yeah, the, the the podcast is is just sort of another branch of the the homegrown tree, I should say. So um, uh, it's something new for us. It's something different, and we do hope that you enjoy it. So, um, with that, let's let's uh, talk about or get into um, today's presentation. So today, it, it is titled the the latest and greatest in bedding plants for 2022. All right. So this is what we'll probably start to see um, on the market next year. And, and where was I and what was I doing last week uh, traveling around California? Well, you could see this is one of the stops, one of the sites. Um, it wasn't too shabby. You know, it was tough, tough work, but someone had to do it. And I gladly uh, got to travel with some of my colleagues with uh, um, AgriLife, and then also a couple colleagues from University of Arkansas. So um, this is really what the trials are all about. So it's it's the chance for these breeding companies to introduce um, some of their new products that are coming. Um, some might be uh, additions to, to, to lines that they have. Um, so it's called CAST, um, the California Summer Trials. Now normally, and all the years that I always went, it was always in the spring. So it was always the California spring trials. But due to COVID and things like that, uh, they decided to push it back this year. So uh, it started uh, last Tuesday, flew out last Tuesday, uh, and it lasted, it was from Wednesday through Saturday. Uh, and so there were eight stops. Uh, so the way we did what we went was we flew into Monterey, we covered the Northern California sites, drove down along the coast, 
stopped in Pismo Beach, um, saw this site here, number five, and then drove down to Ventura and saw the last three sites. And as you can see here, uh, this is the number of companies that were presenting. So some of these sites had multiple companies uh, that were presenting and, and, and showing off their product. Some of these companies are seed companies. Some of these companies produce unrooted cuttings offshore. Uh, so it really just depends on what their specialty is. Some just breed, um, like this company here, Morel, they are strictly cyclamen. Uh, so they're, they're showing their cyclamen uh, different varieties. So it, it, it's always a big, big deal for the industry. Um, and so it was a little different this year since uh, it was in the summer. There were some advantages to, to that because we were able to see some plants in ground as opposed to in say March or April when it's still a little bit too cool there. So let's get started. So this is Digitalis pan Panther and you're probably thinking why is he showing a Digitalis? Well, this is a seed Digitalis. Um, I, I, I love Digitalis because it gives you that height in, in the landscape in the spring and all, but this company has bred it where it does not need vernalization. So it doesn't need that cold period, uh, you, which usually occurs from the fall in through uh, early winter. And as you know, down here, our falls and winters, you know, aren't always that cold. So for the grower, or if you are able, if you get uh, some seed of this variety, you can sow it yourself late summer, get the plant to bulk up over the fall, and then in the spring, you should have a presentation like this. So this is, a, you know, a major breakthrough. Anytime we can get perennials that they don't need that cold treatment, that they don't need that vernalization, that's a good thing for us because we can grow it and be successful with it. But great flower production, great color, and it adds that height into the flower beds. Now, this Gerbera, this Garvinia, um, this is the Majestic series. So the Garvinias are, have been out there. Um, we've got the Sweet series. I have two plants uh, in my garden. We have plants down at the um, Genoa Friendship Garden in Precinct 2. And these plants make it through the summer and then they also overwinter. So my plants overwintered this year after that freeze we had in February and the plants made it through down in precinct two. So to find a uh, Gerbera that performs like that is key. The big thing about the Majestic series is the flowers are bigger and you can see here uh, the size of the flowers. Um, the uh, Sweet series, they're smaller, but they do, they, they, they bloom nonstop. Even in the heat of the summer, um, they'll throw a flower every now and then, but they prefer, you know, the early spring and then on the tail end of the uh, fall. But this one is an even larger uh, flower, so it's going to have more pop when you see it in the landscape. This was really interesting. This is a nasturtium, and nasturtium in the past is, is you hardly even ever see it at, at the trials. Um, this is the baby series, and this baby rose down here uh, is a Flora Select winner, which is a European winner. But when we walked into this greenhouse in the full sun, these things looked electric. And I would have never thought of using nasturtium as a bedding plant. You can see it's got nice upright habit. habit. It's not that vining uh, type that, that gets tangled up and things like that. Uh, and then, you know, nasturtium, the flowers are edible. And we've covered some talks on that, on, on edible landscapes and things like that. But, you know, for the cool season, this is really something different. Um, and maybe it's a different way of presenting and using nasturtium uh, in the landscape. Uh, this is uh, just an overview of, this was a trial. Uh, this grower usually picks out one species and then one genus, and then they do... Uh, a major trial with it, a uh, comparison trial. So this is just salvia. Uh, could be salvia garanetica, could be nema rosa, uh, greg eye. Um, there's different species, but there's over a hundred different species or varieties in this trial. The good thing about it is um, 
especially for us down here, you can't go wrong. If you're looking to get some perennials into your borders, into your beds, um, consider salvias. Uh, we, there's early blooming ones, there's summer blooming ones, there's late season blooming ones. You can have um, some sort of salvia blooming in that landscape just about any time during the, the, the course of the growing season. They're great for attracting pollinators, they bring in uh, hummingbirds, they bring in the butterflies. So um, this is more to just give you an idea of the breath and the color and the habit that is available um, with salvia. Um, then we have this, this is Echebecchia, and you're probably saying I've never heard of an Echebecchia. Uh, that's because this is an inter-specific hybrid. This is a cross at, I guess, intergeneric because it's a cross between an Echinacea and a Rudbeckia. Uh, and look at the, the, the colors and the size of the flowers. Uh, so this will perennialize. Um, but it from in talking with uh, Dr. Pemberton up in Overton, uh, he has seen this maybe last for him in his area about two to three years, and then it just sort of dies off. Uh, so it's probably more of a short-lived perennial. Um, I have not tried this yet. This is something that I want to get a hold of and, and get it into our gardens. Um, but you can see the size of the flowers, the number of flowers, the, the unique color combinations, this dark eye with these orange uh, petal tips. Uh, and this is one of the new ones also. So I believe they're up to about six or seven varieties now um, that are uh, available. But it's just interesting how these breeders are able to cross uh, some of these uh, plants that are not even in the same genus um, and, and able to uh, bring them to, to market. So it definitely has that wow factor. And you may see some of these now in the market, some of these Echebecchias, um, since they have been around, but there are some new colors there. This one is, is, is just interesting and it's a cool looking plant. Um, this is Talotus and it's Joey Improved. Now this is an Australian plant and you're probably saying, well, you know, Australia is nice and dry and hot. Um, it's not like uh, uh, what our conditions here with the humidity. And what I would say is this is a plant, and in talking with uh, some of the other colleagues, if you're gonna grow this here in Texas, you're, you're gonna wanna grow this in a container. Uh, and even if you, if you have a container, um, maybe even consider a clay pot where it's gonna dry out for you on a regular basis. But this is, it, it's just got a, a very cool texture. It's not something for a landscape, but it's definitely a patio type plant. Um, but you can see the flower production on this. And this is just something that the, the uh, original one was a little bit more rangy. Um, the flower spikes weren't as compact and tight as they are now. Uh, in this variety or in the improved variety, but it's something that's really just kind of cool to see. Uh, so if you do see it, consider it as a container plant uh, and um, use it as a, uh, a patio plant. Uh, and in, it's definitely a, uh, a conversation starter, that's for sure. Begonias, um, the big series just has that wow factor, large foliage, large flowers. These are your, uh, you know, bodacious begonias, uh, dark foliage, green foliage. Um, there's even a white flowered one now with the, with the green foliage. These do great in the landscape. They also do exceptionally well in containers. They will do well in full sun. They'll do well in part shade. So if you want something that has that wow effect, if you want if you have large containers on either either side of your door uh, and you want something to, uh, you know, set that off, you know, two large containers with with some of these uh, big series begonias in there uh, will definitely uh, improve that uh, curb appeal uh, to the front of your house. Now, Hellenium, um, common name on this is sneezeweed and helenium is is native uh it's usually like a ditch weed here in in texas and it's called sneezeweed not because it makes you sneeze but it actually helps with as a decongestant and and helps clear you up in in the old days but this is a nice looking perennial this is the heyday series uh and you can see they've got this yellow um they've got the bicolor red uh, they've got a couple other colors in it that, that are bronzy, but it's a nice sort of mid-size 
uh, perennial that will do well under our conditions. Um, it will take the heat. It will take our um, our clay soils. So this Hellenium is one on the perennial side that you might want to keep an eye out for uh, and consider. Now this one, it you know, this is a petunia and it is fun house and it's got a unique color break. Um, haven't seen anything like this. Every time, you know, petunias are a dime a dozen, but it's amazing what these breeders continue to do uh, and come up with color combinations, spotting, flecking, and things like that. So this Funhouse series, um, this one is called Potpourri, uh, and this is one that it's it's a standalone now, but they will continue to add to this Funhouse series, and it's it's just going to be these unique um, color combinations. Uh, you could see it's more of a what we call a grandiflora, so it's got the large flower. But you can see how it nicely produces flowers over the entire plant. So in the landscape or or in in combinations or even in a, just a patio type planter, um, this plant's going to have some wow effect and, and definitely catch your eye. Now marigolds are, you know, a dime a dozen again, but this one is unique um because it is a triploid and it is another uh, this is an interspecific hybrid so this is the endurance series there's these three colors so we've got yellow orange and then this sunset gold uh you can see in this uh, this uh up close picture uh it wasn't presenting itself real well but the the tips are more orange and then you've got that yellow color so this is got breeding of the French marigolds, which are the small, compact, little flowers. And then the um, uh, Tajidis indica, which are the large flower ones. So we've got the best of both worlds here. We've got larger flowers on it compared to the typical um, French marigold. Uh, but we've got the compact habit of the French marigold. And the problem with French marigolds here in the landscape, uh, they are often spider mite magnets um, where we don't see it with the indicas as, as much. There must, there's something that they produce internally that keeps the uh, spider mites away. So this one is, it's sort of a mid-sized flower, unique color with this um, sunset gold, um, but it's, it's something that you can still use probably in the front of the bed, but you're going to get a little bit more flower pop, pop to it uh, when compared to the uh, French marigolds. Now we we talked about I talked about the big begonias. Um, this is Viking, so this is another breeder. The thing that is unique about them is they've got this within the Vikings. They have what they call the Explorer, which is a cascading type. So think of this if you had a large hanging basket. Uh, and you've got these nice flowers, but even in large containers you could get by using that explorer type. The other one that's that's a unique color break is this one here. You can see how dark that is, you know, from a distance, but it's got that what they call their chocolate foliage. It, it's more of a brownish. It's it, it's not as say bronzy as the other one. It's definitely got a chocolate look to it, which is unique. Um, so again, we've got the bigs, we've got the Vikings. So Depending on what you find, what you see out there, um, these are the ones, large containers, or even in the landscape, they will perform extremely well. Now, this is something uh, that I was really uh, uh, taken aback by, especially when we walked in and, and, and you see this color uh, pop at you. So you, this series is called Super Cow Petunias. And what that means is this is another uh, intergeneric hybrid. This is petunias crossed with uh, calabracoa. So calabracoa is, is looks like uh, is a petunia like flower, but they're usually very small. But the color combinations within calabracoa are really unique. Um, really, really just wow you. Where petunias, you don't you don't have the, those type of colors. So this company is able to breed them. And um, this one, I believe, is called Sunset Orange, which is a new introduction. Uh, and here it's being used in a combination. And, and to me, this is something that a grower or even um, yourself, I, I could see this more as a 
uh, a fall type combination or a fall plant. It's got that fall like look to it. Um, it's going to last longer than say chrysanthemums. You know, people buy mums, they last for two weeks if you're lucky and then they they just go out of flower and then, you know, they, they don't last anymore. But these in the fall just would continue to bloom. We'd get cooler uh, temperatures. I think there's definitely a, uh, a spot for this. So this is one that I'm thinking about bringing in some samples and just putting some combinations together and see, you know, could we hit the market? Could we hit the window for um, um, right around uh, Halloween, the end of October? Uh, because I think between Halloween and uh, Thanksgiving, uh, the colors on this would definitely lend themselves to it. So. Um, super cow petunias is one that uh, is really interesting. Uh, the other interesting thing or uh, zinnia that we saw is um, the perfusion series have been around. Cicada is the breeder. They've won multiple All-American selections on these. They, they are great. These are the small compact ones. Um, they bury their dead, so the new growth comes up over the old flowers. You don't have to deadhead them. Uh, and we've got this in our trial beds now down at uh, GFG because uh, it was an All-American selection. But this is um, red-yellow bicolor. And so all the other ones have been solid colors. Like this one here is Perfusion Double Red. They've had doubles and singles, but they haven't had bicolors yet. So now there's this red-yellow bicolor, and I'm sure we're going to see some new bicolors as we um work our way through you know over the years uh the this company will be introducing some new ones so i'm ex i was excited to see it there and i'm going to be excited to you know see how it does for us down in our trial beds in uh at genoa friendship garden now phlox i've always loved phlox phlox has a great fragrance you can use it as a cut flower it's a great perennial we have a, a variety um uh, in our trial beds now, but uh, I want to get a hold of these. Th this is the Flame series. So uh, this company, Duman, they're they're a German breeding company, and um, I remember the Flame series coming out when I was still doing new products. So that's been a while ago. But they have improved these over time. The color range, the size. So they have the Flame, and then they have the Flame Pro. And uh, I'm sorry, but yeah, you'd be pretty hard to not want to buy that or pull that off the shelf uh, in the store if you saw something like that in bloom. They will perennialize. They'll they'll produce throughout the, the entire season. So I'm just curious. I'd, I'd love to, I want to get them here for for next year um, just to get them through and see how well they're going to perform to make sure that they're um, powdery mildew resistant or tolerant, I should say. So they you know how clean they will be. And, and how tall they will get in the landscape. But, you know, these bicolors and some of these hot colors that we're seeing up uh, in this one here uh, just really catches your eye. And, and they've even had them now where they're selling them as a combination. So they've got maybe three different colors together and they work really well. So uh, the Flame Series is one to uh, keep an eye out for. Um, Tropicals, Mandevilla. Um, this one is Sunbeam, and just look at that color on that. So it's got this nice orange throat, and then you've got these this you know pretty clean and vivid uh, yellow petals. So they work off of each other really well. And you know we know we can grow um, uh, Mandevillas down here without any issue. But this this color combination, you got that nice dark gr uh, glossy green foliage. So the flowers play off of that real well. So this is one that um, uh, should be a no brainer for us uh, in our conditions. Now look at this. What do you think of this? This is a Kufia and I love the name Hummingbirds Lunch. So, you know, we we can grow Kufia down here. It, it grows like crazy, but I've never seen this habit, this spreading hanging basket type habit. Um, so, you know, you, you can definitely see this in a large planter or in a uh, hanging basket and the but when when the hummingbirds come through or if we've got butterflies coming through or even the better beneficial insects 
just working these flowers, uh, looking for that nectar. So this is extremely interesting. Um, it sounds like you're going to probably see this quite a bit next year because I think even the box stores are interested in this plant. Um, but this has just got, you know, Kufi has always been one where the, the flowers are there. They're pretty cool, they're, but you know, just the mass, the number of flowers, and then that habit um, is is really something that's unique. Uh, uh, and so this is another one that I I would definitely love to see. I'm hoping some growers here jump onto this uh, and do it in hanging baskets and 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 see how it performs. And if you like that one for a hanging basket to bring the hummingbirds in. What about this one? This is Hummingbird Falls. This is a salvia that is vertically challenged, okay? So it is a spreader. It is a hanging basket type. Um, this is a Garanetica type uh, species. So um, it's got these nice purple flowers and the calyx is a dark color, so you have a nice contrast, but you can grow it as a hanging basket. So imagine if you had that Kufia, and now you've got this salvia. Um, you've got a food source to bring those beneficials, to bring those pollinators, to keep the hummingbirds around when they're coming through. Um, it's again, it's just a different form, but it's a it, it fits a a, a solution um, that maybe we didn't even think um, we wanted or or didn't know it was out there. Um, so this is hummingbird falls. And I do think this is another one. I think when we were going through, they told us that the um, uh, some of the box stores were jumping on this. So um, we, we we should be able to find both of these um, next year in the market. Now, for my UT fans, um, what do you think of this orange petunia? Uh, does this say neon electric? Um, this was out for a while uh, and then there was some issues with the um, that color um, as to how it was developed so there was some legal issues but it is back um, and it's called hell's heat rather interesting name and there's some other colors within orange shades that are back here but this is the one that just really uh, it looks electric like someone plugged it in and uh, it's a neon sign so in that full sun this thing just really lights up um, and there hasn't been any oranges uh, before so again this is another type of petunia maybe for that fall market you know to go up against chrysanthemums and things like that um, but this is just a, a really interesting color break and color introduction uh, into petunias and I'm sure we're going to see more of this color being introduced for by other uh, uh, breeders. Portulaca 24-7 what does that mean just what it says so one of the knocks on Portulaca is well and one of the knocks I have on it is is, is at market um, especially in the box stores, they will put this in a shaded area. And what's the problem that needs full sun in order for these flowers to open? So um, as long as you can get this in full sun, it's gonna sell itself when, when you see it uh, at the garden center. But the other knock on it is uh, a lot of times if you leave work early, the flowers aren't open yet because the, you know, the sun isn't up high enough yet. And then by the time you get home, sometimes those flowers are closed up already. Well, this is your answer. Um, this is, uh, these varieties are supposed to stay open all day, which is great. Um, so you can enjoy that flower color um, throughout the entire day. The other thing that's great about Portulaca is, you know, they are um, low water requirements, low growing plants. Um, so for drought conditions, they do extremely well. So uh, I believe there's four or five colors in this. So this is one that uh, I'm going to be interested to see um, as it comes into the market, if we can get a hold of some, because I'd like to, to definitely see how well the, these flowers stay open and how long they stay open. Um, but I sh I'm sure it's been tested. But it, it, this is, again, uh, answering another solution, these breeders have come up um, with this new series. Um, here's a Celosia Arabana Red. Um, the thing that caught me my eye on this is A, the color. 
so the young flowers are sort of an orangey color. So it almost looks like a flame. And then as it matures, it turns red. Um, the stems on this were extremely stiff. Um, so it's it's not going to get knocked around. Uh, it, when in one of our rain, you know, heavy rains that we've had, th this plant's going to hold its own. Um, and the other thing is, I believe they said it was day length neutral. So sometimes with Celosia, it needs um, long or short days to initiate, and then it, it will continue to bloom uh, during long, day, long days. But if it doesn't get those short days to initiate, it won't start to bloom until the fall. Uh, here is a close up. So you can see how this orange presents itself uh, in the new flower. Uh, and you can see all these new ones have it in, in the tips here. So it really has a great color, great look to it. Lots of good production. Uh, it's just a plant that um, is performing ex extremely well. Here's a salvia that I had not seen before, and I've seen a lot of salvias, but this is one called Lancelot. And this is from seed, and this is a uh, salvia canariensis, so from the Canary Islands. But it's got this silvery, velvety foliage. Um, it's got these purple flower spikes, so you've got a nice contrast when it starts to bloom. And this is one that's very drought tolerant. So uh, if we are in a drought or in, under dry conditions, um, this plant's going to continue to grow and thrive. Uh, Brent has had this up in Overton. It has performed extremely well for him. Uh, it's one that he's really high on. So, um, and the breeder, uh, the rep said they were going to send some seed over to me in order to uh, uh, get it up and growing and, and get it into our garden. But this is one that, and the honeybees were just working this plant like crazy with all the flowers here. So, um, Salvia Lancelot. Um, the Dianthus, the Jolt series, it has been around. This is available. I think this uh, cherry is a new color. The thing I love, I love about this Jolt is, again, it's another interspecific hybrid. So a lot of times Dianthus are a cool season crop for us. And then when the heat comes along, they just don't perform well. This Jolt, um, the very first one that came out, I think it was the purple. Um, this thing blooms throughout the entire summer for us. Um, and it's got very thick, sturdy stems. So it's going to hold up under a rain. Um, it's great as a cut flower. Again, this, this has some of the, the typical Dianthus, but it's also got Dianthus barbatus, which is Sweet William. So that fragrance is a little bit stronger in it. But just look at the flower production on these. Um, you know, great colors, great flower production, not an overly large plant either, you know, so you're, we're looking probably in the mid mid section of that bed, um, but great, great production overall uh, and, and dual purpose, either in the garden or as a cut flower. This is one that, uh, this is a perennial, so we, we've probably seen Artemisia before, um, this is a different species, and, and, and what the, this company is introducing this as, they're calling it the sun fern. So if you think about it, ferns only perform well under shade and sometimes under very heavy deep shade. But landscapers and some designers, they want that fern look in full sunbeds. So this is what they're looking, uh, th this is going to be their suggestion, uh, their alternative. And so we have Arcadia and Olympia. And so um, Arcadia, the foliage is a little bit finer. Um, and Olympia, you can see it's a little bit larger. Will it be accepted? Will it be used? Um, it will be interesting to see. But it does give you that look if you are looking for that in the landscape. Since it is a perennial, this is a landscape plant. So you can have that fern-like presentation in your beds. And then Budlia, um, you know, there's there's a lot of new Budlias. They're they're getting smaller, more compact. They're getting to the point where they're um, they're male male sterile, so they will continue to bloom and not set seeds, so they don't become invasive. Um, this is a, the chrysalis series, uh, and so you can see. I think there's about four or five colors. Um, and you can see this is these plants in the landscape. So, you know, within the varieties, they are consistent. They may be across all the varieties, um, 
the colors, they aren't as consistent. But, um, you know, for that nice, tight, compact habit, um, it presents itself pretty well. The flowers aren't as big. Um, this is probably the typical flower length uh, that it has. And I know uh, the comments were made, especially with the white, where, um, you know, it, it turns brown. So that may not present itself real well. People may not like that. But um, if you've got a tight space, if you've got a small space and you want to get a budlia in there in order to attract, you know, those butterflies and beneficials and things like that, um, this is a series you might want to consider. Uh, the bee's knees petunia again, this this yellow. So we've got orange petunias, we've got multicolored petunias, and this yellow is very clean, very strong. Um, just look at it in the landscape here. Um, just very good flower production over the entire plant, just performing extremely well. You can see it in containers, you can see it in baskets. So um, overall, just a really great color break that you will probably see more of this uh, next year uh, in the market. And then Angelonia. Angelonia is a great uh, annual to grow for our summer heat and humidity. It, it just is nonstop, goes and goes and goes. So this angel mist series is spreading. So you can use it as a hanging basket. So think back to the hummingbird plants and things like that. You know, here's another form of angelonia that, you know, beneficials and pollinators love. Now we can use it as a hanging basket. So again, a, another form meeting another need uh, in order to, we all want to bring those beneficials and pollinators in, here's another option uh, that we can do, even if we've got a small area, uh, we've got a small patio type house or a uh, condo or something like that. Um, we, you've, got, you, you've got options now. And the same with, with this. So Lantana, there's a lot of very good compact um, varieties. This is a new one, Shamrock. But again, you could see this either as a, a patio planter or as um, in a hanging basket where you're bringing in those beneficials again. Um, this is nice because, you know, if you think about new gold, which has been around forever and how aggressive and how big that is, um, this one's nice and tidy, has lots of flower production on it, and just does it, looks like it, 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 it will perform extremely well. And if you can't grow a lantana down here, then um, we gotta work with you because lantanas just uh, thrive and grow like crazy. So uh, it, they should not be an issue. Um, let's talk about a little bit about vegetables. So kitchen mini. So we we've got I got some sample seed of this already, and it's been dispersed. The master gardeners have some. I have some here at the house. And so the thought of this is this is something that would grow in a four inch pot, and you can see the the fruit production. It produces fruit for about thirty days, um, and then it stops. And so it it says. Uh, uh, I forget what their their catch line is 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 something like uh, plant eat repeat uh, something like that um, and so the thought is the grower would actually grow these up to the point where they have already fruit set on them uh, and then they would go into the market so if you've got uh, a sunny windowsill or you want them as a patio you just put them out there they color up you harvest the fruit off of them and you and and then you're done with it you go buy another one um, because they're not going to be they're not going to produce the way your typical garden type uh, tomato produces um, my wife she harvested some off of ours they didn't taste too bad um, you know they're they're these small little ones we do they also have peppers in this um, uh, kitchen minis but it's a good way for people that maybe have you know uh, they're in apartments, maybe they have a balcony, they have enough sun, but they want to grow some. They want to, you know, start working, uh, getting that, developing that green thumb. This is a nice entry plant um, that they could use in order to get some peppers or some tomatoes uh, and, and just feel good about the whole gardening uh, situation. Th this one was really cool. Um, this one is called, this is a pepper, candy cane chocolate cherry. So it's got a, a mouthful of a name, but um, the plant itself is variegated. So it's green and red. As it matures, it's more green. I, I'm sorry, green and white. 
not green and red, green and white. So it's got green and white variegation. Um, as it's young, it's, it's, it's more prominent. As it matures, it's more green. Um, but then it sets fruit with this striping in it. Uh, so this is off of uh, the block that they had there. So you can see the various color combinations. So it's just something different. It's, it's unique. Um, we tasted it. It tasted great. They gave us some. Um, and it's, you know, we, we talk about edible landscapes and, and how to, to work uh, edibles into your landscape if you don't want a full on vegetable garden. And so this candy cane chocolate cherry is something that, you know, prior to it fruiting and, and flowering, you know, you've got a variegated foliage plant in there. Uh, and then when it goes and, and flowers and sets fruit, you're going to have some unique looking uh, fruits uh, to catch your eye also. So that that one was. Um, really pretty interesting. This one, this Pepe Corn uh, Cornissimo, this is, and I have never seen this, this is a, a, a sweet pepper, but it is seedless. Um, so there are no seeds inside there, uh, which is really pretty interesting. So if you cook with them, if you like stuffing them, if you like making poppers or something, you can cut that open and, and they grabbed one, you know, what, somebody in our group grabbed one, they broke it in half and there was no seeds in there. Now, the one ca caveat they tell you is if this is planted amongst other peppers and it is cross pollinated, it you can find you will find some seeds in there. So this is if you grow a pepper and you just grow Pepe Cornissimo uh, and there's no other pepper pollen around, you're going to have seedless peppers. Um, if you've got it mixed in with some other ones, there's a good chance that you might find a seed or two, a couple seeds in there, but you're not going to find the seed production like you would for um, some of the other varieties. So again, something unique, something different um, in pepper breeding. Now let's just talk about uh, close out here. I'm just, I just want to touch on combo planters and I, I really just to give you ideas of, of what works, what colors work, um, things that you can just go to the garden center and buy a three inch plant of this, a three inch, you know, three inch pot of this, 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 and this, and put it together. So uh, when I talked about those, the, the flocks, this is a combination of, of that flocks. And you can see it's got the red, the pinks, and the white, and look how well they work together. You know, no, no, uh, thriller, filler, or spiller in this. It's just a bouquet, basically, of flocks. So just look at this and, 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 and for the ideas of, of what's available or, or what you could do. Um, this one I thought was interesting because there's no flowers. All right, so this is a canna. Uh, and then this is just a dark foliage pepper that hasn't um, started to flower yet, doesn't have any fruit yet. But I just thought it was just colors and texture, and that's it. You know, it, it, there, there's no flower. Now, we know the peppers are eventually going to set fruit, and we're going to have, um, you know, some interesting things there to look at. And the cannas are going to bloom, and I think this is a, an, an orange fl flowered one. But, you know, just to enjoy that those different stages, I, I, I would have never thought to put a canna together. So you've got your upright, you got your, you know, almost your thriller look. And then basically their, their fillers are these peppers. So the colors play off of each other real well. And then once they start to bloom and set fruit, we're going to have some other interests. So, um, you know, just something to think about. Here's another one where we're using our, you know, our, our, our thriller, our fillers and our spillers here, but they're all foliage plants. You know, so we've got a grass, we've got two different types of grasses, we've got some dichondra, and then we've just, they're just using the, the fillers, some color, uh, in this case with the petunias. So, you know, it's, it's again, it's, it's not always about different flower colors or flower combinations. Sometimes you can get a nice presentation, a nice look by just using foliage and then using the color, it bring in a color um with the flowers so uh another idea there this one just wowed me i, I just this is that calabrocoa that i mentioned before so it looks like a petunia just smaller and you can see look at the the, the color combinations and, and and the breaks in there 
but just see how they they work well together um, and then we've got some contrast with that cooling color of the the blue or the purple um, but man that, that that just you know put them out on the patio and and have a pina colada or margarita and and, and just enjoy the weekend i mean that that, that color just uh, uh works for me Here's another one. We're we're close to Fourth of July, so you know red, white, and blue is always a challenge. So they've got verbena in here, they've got petunias in here, but you know it's not just a blue petunia. It's sort of that purplish blue, but it's 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 the uh, the candy cane type striped. And then the red is their variety where they have it's flecked. So again, different textures, different colors, but 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 they work together extremely well. And then here's more of these, uh, what they call the confetti series, but just, you know, give you ideas of how these colors can work together. You know, it doesn't have to be these exact plants, but, you know, look with, oh, excuse me, just how, you know, this first row, how these colors, these contrasting colors just sort of light up. Uh, and then you sort of have cooler colors in here in the middle with the pinks and the whites and the and the blues and the purples. And then here you got a little bit more contrasting with the yellows, uh, the purples and the reds. So, you know, think of it as you've, you've got your Crayola crayons, the box of 64 and, and just try it. Um, you know, put this together, that together. Uh, you know, we don't always have to follow the the filler, thriller, and spiller. You know, they can be the same type, and and as they start to grow together, they just inter intermingle and, and really give a a nice presentation. Here's the angelonia. All right, so we talked about the spreading type. What they did was they took the spreading type of the angelonia, and then they have an upright form. Um, so again, that red, white, and blue works together extremely well. Um, again, and it, especially in our area, this plant loves the heat. Uh, so this would bloom for you all summer, but just gives you a nice presentation and, and a different look. I put this one in for our uh, ag agent, uh, Shannon. He wasn't able to join us today. He had another commitment, but um, he's from LSU. And so I just thought this plant would work extremely, this combination work would work extremely well, I guess over there in Baton Rouge. Uh, you know, the, the, this is that bee's knees yellow petunia uh, and then their uh, midnight gold double. Uh, so it's got that yellow edge to it, that picketty edge and then the dark color. So um, you know, I was going to tell Shannon, hey, get your family, start growing these, put up a greenhouse and have these for homecoming uh, weekend over there um, when LSU is playing because this color definitely um, has that wow factor and would definitely uh, fit in that market over there. But they're just great colors. They, they work together extremely well. OK, um, with that, um, you know, the sun is not setting. There's going to be plenty more new products, uh, new introductions uh, over the over the seasons, over the years. But uh, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, Brandy, are there any questions or anything that I can uh, answer? Um, um, there's There's been a lot of discussion, just, you know, okay. admiring everything. But um, there was one question that uh, Mary Jean asked uh, that there were a lot of petunias. Um, but they have a limited lifespan because of our heat. Um, did she miss something like they're, they are more heat tolerant or are they still going to be in the same conditions? I, I they're getting a little bit more heat tolerance, but yeah, usually by and again, it depends on how. How hot, how fast, how hot we get. Um, so we had petunias in our trials this year and I took pictures the first week of May and they were still going strong. And in the past, you know, usually by the middle of April, petunias were, were going south for us, they were crashing. Um, so they are getting a little bit more heat tolerant. Um, and I, I, was, I was curious to see how they were gonna look after we had all that rain in May. Uh, and I actually, I, I think the plants probably would have gone a little bit further in May, but that rain just really did a number on them. Uh, it beat them down. 
uh, and they they did not look good the last time I was out there. Now they were going to leave some of them in place just to see how they would do through the heat of the summer down here. Um, but yeah, it you know petunias are not one. It, you know it's early spring, uh, late winter, early spring, but they're not going to bloom down here for us throughout the entire summer the way they would say up in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, things like that. Yeah, and I, th I think that's it. I think we've all just been um, overwhelmed with all the beauty that you had to show us today. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am uh, glad I, you know you enjoyed it. I uh, I definitely enjoyed going out there, and that that's uh, I, I think that was forty slides, and that, believe me, I took way more than that. So uh, you know, narrowing it down uh, to 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 show those highlights. Uh, is always a challenge, but um, yeah, keep your eye out for them. Uh, some of these things we will try and get in and get into our beds just so we can confirm, you know, how well they perform. You know, even though we see them out there and we know they've been trialed prior up to that, we always want to make sure that they are going to do uh, what the breeders say they're going to do for us down here in Houston. So um, yeah, it was fun and uh, look forward to moving forward with it. All right. Well, thank you. Um, thanks again for joining us for another Homegrown. Uh, we are offering this twice a month, so I am next uh, in two weeks talking about hummingbird safety. Uh, really, that's just going to cover, you know, what to grow. But, you know, I, obviously there's there's a lot of um, tips and tricks to keeping our hum hummingbirds safe. So we'll just uh, cover some of those. And it's going to be the perfect time because uh, the migrating hummingbirds are going to be coming back uh, pretty soon. So thank you for joining us. Please fill out our survey that we're going to send. I know it's every time, but uh, it, it really does help us justify being able to do this online and not taking them uh, in person. And plus, you always give like a lot of really great feedback. So it only takes a couple minutes, fill that out. Thank you very much and have a great 4th of July.